This is a production of Cornell University. Ithacans, Cornellians, country folk, <laughs> lend me your ears. <laughs> and welcome to the 2018 Cornell MFA graduation reading. It's a glorious mouthful, isn't it? Um, I would like to take an opportunity right now as we're all settling in to please silence your cell phones and electronic devices uh, in courtesy of the readers this afternoon. Thank you very much. I would also like to remind you that after the reading today, uh, there will be a reception in the English Lounge in uh, 258 Goldwyn Smith Hall, right above where we are. It's really the door that's open since it is a Saturday. Um, so anyway, let us get underway and celebrate these wonderful second year poets and fiction writers. Uh, today, the superstars who are reading are Neil Giannone, Christina Carrera, Peter Gilbert, Emily Mercurio, Shakarian Hutchinson, Weena Poon, Carl Moon, Hema Surendranathan, and your humble host, Lindsay Warren. But before we get underway with the reading, we have a lot of people to thank, because a lot of people have helped us on this journey to get to this point. A huge, gigantic, colossal thank you to the creative writing faculty for their brilliance and their support over these past couple years. A big thank you to David Pickett and the Pickett family for their generosity, for keeping us financially afloat, and for continuing to do so. A big thank you to the English department uh, both teachers and administrators for guiding us and for saving us time after time after time these past couple years. A big thank you to Michael Cook and all of the staff at Epic. Thank you especially, Michael, for making sure we always had money for soup that first year. Delicious, delicious soup. A special thank you to the first, third, and fourth years for their special brand of genius and for their help and for their tremendous ability and helping to shape our creative community here at Cornell. And of course, a giant thank you to our friends and family for your encouragement, for your love, for your patience. Thank you for being here today. Uh, and thank you to those who couldn't make it today um, who are not here with us in the flesh, but are here with us in spirit. And now, without any further ado, may I introduce to you, dear audience, a man who writes like a tiger and smells like a sandwich, <laughs> the one and only Neil Giannone. Hello. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, I, I would like to uh, just reiterate uh, Lindsay's thanks um, to the fiction faculty, uh, the poetry faculty who I've had to run into occasionally, and um, the English office, uh, all the amazing people behind the scenes, um, the cohorts above me and below me, but specifically uh, mine. You guys are awesome, and I have a crush on all of you. <laughs> this is called. Um, the glory of dirt. The dirt under Jenny's nails is an industry. The mud on her knees is a fashion. In her spare time, she fills bags with dirt and throws them at the protesters who vulture the steps of Planned Parenthood. This avocation has created many problems in Jenny's life. Her boss has told her that if she wants to keep selling ice cream under the umbrella at the wharf, she needs to make more of an effort with her hygiene. But Jenny's very loyal to her dirt. It's been her only friend when she's had none. Even her younger sister, when she visits, doesn't understand the plantless pots of dirt scattered about Jenny's apartment. So she quits selling ice cream and gets a job at the local strip club. Her responsibility is to spray down the lap dance booth after use. The cleaner she uses has an especially potent astringency and eats the skin at her fingertips. And after a month in the job, her fingers look circumcised. The dirt under her nails remains. When she sprays down and scrubs the booth's musty crack vinyl, she dreams of getting promoted to massage girl so she can let loose her fingers on guilty skin. In high school, Jenny would spit toilet water on the girls who called her a fungus. She would kiss the boys who called her curd face. This often got her sent to the assistant principal's office where she was made to sit with crossed knees and was lectured on the tenets of feminine decorum. This assistant principal was young. He wore tailored suits, but he was always drinking coffee and mouth breathing on the students. 
Jenny wondered what it would be like to kiss his coffee breath with her toilet water mouth. Is this how the French kiss, she thought? Years later, drinking Mai Tais in a hotel lounge, Jenny watched a pair of legs legato across the ballroom floor. Is this what the assistant principal meant by feminine? But where was the torso? At the health food store, a girl with blue hair suggests Jenny soak her fingers in marigold tea. She says the tri triterpenes will help with the skin heal faster and give them a honey glow. At home, she boils the seeds and soaks her fingertips in the broth. Soon after, she becomes nauseous and is forced into a ball on her bathroom floor. The room begins to shift and the bathtub's molding, mold riddled cocking begins to see a coarse line of embryos. They doff their top hats and twirl their canes. She wonders if this is punishment for harassing the pro-lifers. She wonders if being a virgin makes her a hypocrite. Jenny laughs to herself and the towel grout squirms like umbilical cords. After six hours on the bathroom floor, she runs her hands under the tap and decides the water feels as tense as an orgasm would. Jenny wakes at six the next evening. She remembers little after arranging her furniture in alphabetical order. But despite her hangover, she notices that her senses have become heightened. She can hear the metro 20 blocks away. She can smell the cherry blossoms as they both bloom and decay on the uncertain arrival of spring. She realizes despite the zeal of the blue-haired girl at the health food store, that she hasn't been given the smooth salve of marigold, but a packet of morning glory seeds instead. The packet reads, morning glories thrive in a strong, well-drained soil and sunny site with plenty of water, but they'll do well almost anywhere. At her door, Jenny can hear the universe clearing its throat. In the garden behind Planned Parenthood, Jenny laces the bags of dirt with morning glory seeds, and with the temples of her eyeglasses, pokes holes in the bags for good measure. She thinks of her youth, how she used to feed her little sister mud pies and chocolate milk puddle water. When her, sis yes. when her sister refused, Jenny would say, I haven't sweated over this pile of mud all day to get lit from you. In the summer, Jenny once prepared her sister boiled skunk cabbage. When her father found out, he got sore at Jenny for using the, the stove without permission and put her on top of the tallest bookshelf in the living room. He left her there for the, for the duration of Independence Day. But despite her fear, she felt special for being closer to the fireworks than her sister was. Jenny throws the bags of dirt at the protesters. Like shrapnel, the seeds and dirt explore toward the bilious eyes and mouths. The protesters walk about like hens. They spit at their shoes. They take off their clothes and make art out of their protest signs. Jenny is unsure in what she's done. With her heightened sense of sight, the protesters' bodies seem less dogmatic in the nude light. Jenny begins wearing a cape to work. It is yellow and she's drawn her initials on it with a blue marker. She worries that her monogram resembles a swastika and that people may confuse her for a Nazi or a manager of Ikea. However, wearing the cape, she feels confident in her ability to abate any potential conflict. At the end of the night, Jenny pulls the curtain back of the deluxe lap dance booth and discovers one of the male protesters from Planned Parenthood. His eyes are half closed and he's trying to catch his sweaty breath and peel himself from the vinyl. Jenny freezes. She feels powerless without her bags of dirt. But when, she reaches for her, but when he reaches for her cape to help himself up, she sees his once naked body burned into her memory, how it betrayed itself, his hands and face forever posed in positions of submission. It's okay, she says to the man. I'm a hypocrite too. When Jenny discovered her father in the garage after a quarrelsome family dinner, standing over his second wife with a raised wine bottle, Jenny realized fear was no different than temperature, that it was just a measure of something always there. In her first semester of college, she was taught that behavior is 50% nature and 50% nurture. She ran out of tuition money and dropped out before she learned that all matter is merely energy condensed to a slow vibration, that we are all one consciousness experiencing itself subjectively. There is no such thing as death. Life is only a dream, and we are the imagination of ourselves. Jenny remembers the first time she was called pretty, and the first time she, she realized she wasn't. The boy had taken her for ice cream under the umbrella at the wharf. He took her for a drive in the country. Afterward, he said the dirt under her nails was an industry. The mud on her knees was a fashion. Thank you. And now, 
Uh, the amazing Christina Correra. Christina was recently published by Dialogo, Dialogo, the Missouri Review and the Tri-Quarterly and awarded recognition by Canto Mundo, Hedgebrook Foundation and the Naropa University Summer Writing Program. Her poem, Reflection from a Bridge, was selected by Tracy K. Smith. Did you hear that? <laughs> For the 2015 Best New Poet Anthology, she is composing a collection of poems that consider the relationship between grief and identity. Christina Carrera. I just want to look at you for a second. I know I have seven minutes, but I, I factored in looking at everyone first <laughs> because it helps me not be nervous. Um, and also to be grateful, I wanted to take just a second to feel thankful for this. Um, I never in a million years thought I would be here. So uh, thank you all for being here with me and you all for being here with me and you all for being here with me. Oh, I can't look over there. Emotional. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. So I have three poems, and I'll just skate right through them. Watching the Orionids in a nearby campground from the hood of a rental car. Who am I, after all? I want to ask the blistering tale of Haley's Comet decayed shards gliding loudly above us all, firing up that ocular space to the sides of me, that hard to reach periphery. Assemblage of mind and matter, notch on the spine of time that cannot be regained. There, the sky's landfill illuminated piles of plasma Look, underbelly of meaning, see, and thoughts. One, our uncomplicated blips. Two, stardust that shoots across the night. See, revealed by a new month. But these are not feelings. None of this is real. Geese spear the sky in rubber cries of determination eking out their calls like first breaths, eager to be somewhere. We all lurk just for tonight, hidden from our predators and demons, digging stiffly into a bag of chips, testing our eyes for sensitivity, muscles flexing in the growing cold. Sepulchritude. In a place I want always to see you, from a box I pried open with a pocket knife, you spilled out like powdered milk. Your memories were everywhere, in the rainbow, in the double rainbow, in the hermit crab's slow ascent, in each crag, your hair mixing with the tidal pools, your nails foaming at the surf, your mouth a small break in the sky for one crooked cloud. Your skin a tacky wind that pressed. I was almost taken by a wave so large it seemed planned. A last chance to join you, gripping the back of my neck with its cold hand from beneath the surface of sea light of January, which had been your vigilance. Your beautiful grave is a trap that wants you dead and me alive. It forces us to just be human. Rivulets, algae, sand, salt. All that gets caught stops to be surrounded and transformed by wall and wind. Eternal and ubiquitous in some perfect combination. But I am stubborn, bullying the questions I hope will disintegrate quickly, quietly, so I don't have to hear the crushing of their stupefied bones. No one else knows this stretch of memory, 
like a stomach lining, vulnerable and devoid of nutrient. That you were once a child who didn't want to be alone, to beg for what would keep him alive. The streets you ambled down barefoot and dripping filthy sweat are marked now by fast food chains and supermarkets. Gone is the abundance of shacks lined with brightly nectared fruits and the canopy of steam from oversized scalded pots of ochre, spiced rice and stew. And the doña with the presence of the sea who took pity on your stunted bones and said, come here, have a little something to eat. But I am there and I can see from here in this picturesque vault, collagen spreading into that thin broth that tips me back and keeps me full. I want to take one more look. <laughs> this is the last look I'll have from here. Um, special thank you, Elena, to you're right there. <laughs> this lie right here. Lyra, thank you. And Aishin and Valgina in the camera in the future. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay, last poem. My mind is a long song. It must be a bell-strapped bird after all, tapping its rhythms through my sweaty dreams. A tight little seed, a growing signal. Vice grip still nameless in my throat, pink. A night terror taps a storm on my roof. Some old drain pipe releases its heavy steam. What tongue-tied stage is this now, rosy proof? A rotten weed and a miserable sea? An open corridor for breath, the throat is a moment, after all, that I'll miss. Thirsty pebble unloosed down a narrow passage, slight quiver before the abyss. A moment, after all, that I'll miss it. Dim exhale, a windswept doorway, a moat. What I want is a wing, eager and well lit, 20 chimes ringing outside my window. Thank you. Um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. And now, Peter Gilbert in the words of Peter Gilbert is, oh, does, <laughs> writes, <laughs> writes drafts of novels and then deletes them. He has been doing this since he was 16 years old. He also teaches, which is harder, true. He's currently editing the second draft of his third novel and is hoping to delete, to delete it before the autumnal equinox. <laughs> um, he was born and raised in Seattle. Come on. Ooh. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. I really appreciate it. It means a lot. Uh, let's, I'm just going to get tuned to it. Uh, this is a monologue from um, Supermodel. And it's kind of prose poetry y, so we'll see. <clears throat> it's called Consensus Reality. I lie beneath the great sphinx being photographed by industry monkeys who've mistaken themselves as artists. I am gleaming in the sun and wearing something vaguely pharaonic. You know me already, for I am the founder, director, and lead model of the artfully progressive core modeling group. But it would be more accurate to think of me as a cultural saboteur. You will see, with one photo, I sell a million bras and unleash pandemonium. Let me tell you how. When I abandoned a communications major at Bard College to establish an iconoclastic modeling house, I believed popular personality could be a catalyst for social advancement. Now I know the opposite is true. Much more than snapping my photo, these photographers are spreading a discreet botulism throughout the world. The telephoto lenses pointed at me are the many eyes of a superior creature, a behemoth whom we all worship and disdain. You may wish to ask, what should a mere human do when she becomes the object of this monster's attention? 
You see, the telephoto lenses, um, well, first, consider. These cameras, these many God's eyes, they are pointed at you for now. But there are over 500 other models lounging with a skeleton similar to your own, darling, except their spines are a tad more delicate. Their cheekbones flare a little sharper. Their lips a Revlon layer smoochier than yours. Those 500 or so other models are reclining beneath the jungle fronds and being spritzed by serious men wearing headsets and cargo shorts. They all wish to unthrone me. And as I lounge here beneath the Sphinx, the camera shutters rattle like a dealer shuffling a very stiff deck of cards. And I consider my hapless audience. The first, last, and every in-between thing I ask myself is, how can I cure their content obesity with a glimpse of something lean and simple, authentic? Or in other words, how shall I trap them? For that is what I do, men, women, the between gendered. They see me in those glossy ads, they read my articles, my tweets on oppressive structures embedded in the fashion industry, and they wonder, how can one mammal be endowed with such magnitudes of beauty and intelligence? They snicker at my critiques of popular artists and poof, they're trapped, poisoned. They ponder the curve of my clavicle and something metastasizes inside them for weeks, months, until they feel like killing themselves, darling, or until they feel like killing someone else, or even better, both. I am the best at setting traps and administering poisons. I do not strike poses or build theses. I manifest toxic truths. This is why I am founder, director, and lead model of the Core Modeling Group. As you already know, the Core Modeling Group strives to represent peoples from every global South nation, every possible identity category. We have models from the inner cities, the outer cities, the suburbs, the exurbs, the new burbs, models who've rebelled against their own bodies, models of every possible race and ethnicity and sexual orientation, models who grew up in hardware stores, models who pined for pastors and scrubbed kitchen floors, models who worked as fluffers in LA porn studios or who taught special ed. We only wear garments that scrutinize every link in the supply chain. Our fragrances are distilled from the ass fat of dictators and fascists. But all of that has proven to be smoke and mirrors. We are all of us hypocrites, and I am the most hypocritical of all. You see, we were in the tandem bar off the Jefferson L stop, having a rollicking good time, drinking pitchers of milk and gin, having sex in the bathrooms, injecting our perfect faces with cocaine dissolved in Afrin nasal spray when a sweaty man who smelled of camphor stood and delivered a 100-line poem titled, There Is No Free Trade Cocaine. Its lines explained how every point in the production chain of cocaine is piled with the corpses of the global south. I turned to my friends and employees. Our faces were ashen, perhaps more gorgeous because shameful. We were, in a sense, inhaling the ground-down bodies of peasants, riding the flux of dopamine like a shopaholic equipped with a dubious line of credit. So I turned to my core friends in the core modeling group, Giorgio, Simone, Kishana, Rex, Ginsburg, and Radar. I told them, with the authority of lead model friends, we are the unwashed, we are the world's unwashed dildos. You see, it is not really about cocaine, but that no matter how carefully I curated my sense of righteousness, the facts of living, the vagaries of coming and going about the world would lead me to the gates of hell. It was then that I realized how I would use my power. So I'm thinking about this hypocrisy as I lie below the great sphinx in my spangled outfit. One of the photographer monkeys tells me to inflict a certain pose and I silence him with the glare of the fool. The cameras rattle through the dry desert air like well-oiled machine guns. At their elbows contort to accommodate their slick angled shots, I think of my next clandestine assault, my next inflammatory article about the futility of identity or the futility of class or the benefits of cellulite and about how many retweets I'll get. You can't possibly understand what it means to be the brains of the core modeling group. My power is immense. For one photo, I twisted my fingers into a cryptic hand signal, and a million liberals on Tumblr discussed its influence in their dissertations. Two million conservos on 8chan decoded its conspiracies. Right now, they just scream at each other, but with a little luck and the right tweaks, soon they'll be hunting each other down in the American sprawl, and that is why I do it. Give them mazes that lead to suicide and murder. 
You see, I know what Bell Hooks says about Beyonce, what Camille Paglia says about Hillary Clinton, what Stieglitz says about the IMF, and I know why that idiotic rapper keeps extolling the president. I preach body positivity and then post a video on Twitter instructing them how to disperse calories between carefully selected foods like a chemist measuring out reagents. Then I stand in front of a three-way mirror and pinch skin around my body like a tailor measuring for a new dress, turn to the camera and say, a fit body is a responsible vote for universal health care. I tell them to demand diversity and to respect gradualism. I tell them they must wear bikinis, bikinis and burkas, and if they complain, I call them fascists and remind them where I got my fragrance. I tell them their lives matter. I tell them that t-shirts, slogans, social media posts, and marching around in allotted space with signs are forms of activism, and then I go home and ponder their imminent deaths. Then, when I am done pondering for the fools, I take a bubble bath and laugh while eating exotic cheeses. You see, during the origins of communication studies, it was said that the medium is the message. Well, my medium is all mediums, and my message is legion. I lie beneath the great sphinx, whose date and method of construction is still debated, and allow the cameras to record my beauty in order to remind you that your convictions do not matter, for you are already poisoned. Thank you. Emily Rosello Mercurio. Poems have appeared in Pearl, Vallum, Spoon River Poetry Review, and other journals. She's currently finishing work on Slime Child, great title, a collection of poems about nature, embodiment, and the feminine grotesque. And what this actually means is that she writes a lot of poems about bugs. <laughs> I made the typo, it was my program, it's my fault. <laughs> um, I just reiterating everyone's gratitude. This is, has been, continues to be surreal. Um, thank you to my like home row of Italians here. Uh, hi guys. Um, I'm just gonna read a bunch of poems, some from last year, some from this year, all of them in the thesis for now. Um, the first one is kind of nonsensical, kind of on purpose. It's kind of a love poem. It's called Sunny Honey. My Malawi, my kismet star, my baby purple absolute. I climb your open sinuses, slime your hollow gooey ribs. Please, please pick me, a red heart embroidered on a baseball cap. I thread alive in the sunshine. You can feel it in your hands. When we collide, you roll me down the morning hill just like a breeze. Your tongue a leech inside my mouth, your iris bubble wonderful. Whatever you want me to chew, I'll do. My summertime valentine, my open throat, my please, please, please. Um, this next one. Is, this is very close to me. Um, this next one is the titular poem of the thesis manuscript thing. It's called Slime Child. I am the slime child, if that was not clear. <laughs> uh, slime Child. I was born worm and pink, a slime child wriggling in silt. How blush my puddle, how fragrant my ooze. I drank from that breathing brown green. Standing water, small as a dime, me a dime, me a dirty quartz. The high oaks writhed in joy in a breeze in the sun, just trees. They rocked like cradles, whistled all night. The wind whistled with them, and I bubbled from my mud. We twisted and beautiful noodles. We grass babies, we roots. A mud puddle beside a waterfall, my runoff biome thick with ooze. At dawn, I rise alive. I cake my skin in soil and grow mossy, shoot mushrooms from my arms. When I lie in the dirt, I am invisible, am ugly, am rinsed with dirty joy. I know why the water here is green. I know how it threads underground. It tastes so bad, stinks like nothing else. 
The sun beats on my bloom and it grows larger and larger each day. Um, so the next two poems are sonnets, which is weird for me, or it was weird for me until I wrote a bunch of them this semester. Um, and this first one is from a series that I did for workshop, um, which is a heroic crown of sonnets inspired by uh, photographs from the Corning Museum of Glass archives. And a heroic crown of sonnets is 15 sonnets. They're linked. The first. The last line of one is the first line of the next, so on and so forth. And the final sonnet is all the first lines in order. Uh, it was like a dumb project. It took so long, it was so hard. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna read the first one um, from that, which is called Fragment with Fish and Gourd Vine. Oh, melt, unshattered shard of history, the past has tried to break you and it failed. The ancient glint of gold upon your scales remains unchipped, the deep aquamarine unfaded still. What were you meant to be when you were made? So beautifully detailed your handsome fish, a vine of gourds to veil the empty blue which crowns his slippery and crested back. You must have been a part of something so much larger than yourself, a curtain made of coins, each breakable and brilliant until time took it apart, magnificent and multitudinous, now sanded down into the knowable. So this is also a sonnet, but this is not from that sequence. This is about a cute gif of an otter that I saw. It's called Regarding Otters. <laughs> the otter, as a rule, does not engage in worrying about the riverbed beneath her. And if the pollution spreads too much for her, she moves. Invertebrates will be delicious, even with no names to call them by. Stones precious. Overhead, the sun does what it does. The moon was red tonight. No otter, moved by something great and terrifying in her otter soul, attempted to express what it was like to be there, floating under stars without a number, crickets songless, and the whole long night to go. She opened up her bright and fanged mouth, and poetry came out. And then the last poem I'll read today is called Dendrochronology, which is like when you cut a tree down and you figure out how old it is by the rings. Um, but it's not really about that, that's just the title. <laughs> a bug lays eggs in the wood or the genome and you get a fat knot of veins and hair marbling the meat. The trunk, a crop circle of termite teeth. It might take 30 years before you can cut it down and turn it. Apple flowers everywhere exploding pink. A man licks syrup off the bark where wolf spiders dig trap doors above their homes. Red ants on his tongue, a cardinal cracking seeds on his skull. A flock of starlings built their nests in your mouth. He planted an acorn in your stomach and forgot, didn't you, until it started to root. If there's an apple, then bite it. Skin shellacked with beetle wax, a glowing globe gum red. Seeds not poisonous until they hit the gut. Your honey crisp flesh, those paper petals white as maggots. A man with long fingers has begun to turn a bowl. Burls fly apart on the lathe, all those hidden voids. Cups filled with white lines of ribbon worms chewing heart meat, acid and pulp. The trees widows plant on their husbands, branches too wet to burn. Already the gypsy moths have begun to lay their eggs. On a quiet night, you can hear them chewing. Thank you. <laughs> It is now my distinct pleasure to introduce my friend Shakarian Hutchinson. Uh, Shakarian is from the low country of South Carolina, and she's too humble to have mentioned this in the bio in your program, but she was the 2017 fiction winner of the Hurston Wright Award for College Writers. That's a big deal. <laughs> Um, she also has the most impressive collection of pens in Ithaca, New York, possibly the world, Shakarian Hutchinson. <laughs> Good 
Hello. Can y'all hear me? Good. Um, how are y'all doing today? Good. Um, before I begin, just want to take a really quick time, minute to say thank you to my cohort. Uh, eight people I get to say I knew them when. Um, my committee and my family. They're not here. They're in sunny and 90 degrees South Carolina right now. Um, but I imagine they will see this eventually and I want them to know that I love them and thank you. And because when she'll see it, it'll be her birthday. So happy birthday, mama. Uh, okay, so I'm gonna read part of a story called Waldo. Four, I often have this dream of you. It's dawn, the sky is a clear blue with hints of pink and gold running through it. We're standing on the beach. You're in a navy suit, white dress shirt, white pocket square. You're not wearing any shoes and your toes dig into the pearl colored sand beneath your feet. You're looking out at the ocean as the wind coming off the Atlantic gently tussles open your suit jacket. I'm standing on your right facing you. In front of me isn't the 38 year old man found washed up on Hilton Head, but the 15 year old boy who I asked out in front of our lockers our sophomore year. My fingers run over the patchy stubble and razor bumps that define the lower half of your face. I ask you what we're doing out here, but you don't answer me. You ignore me. Each blink of your eyes, each unanswered question, each deep breath feels deliberate, as if you're making a point only to me, but I have no idea what point you're trying to make. I look out, I look out at the ocean with you. The water is unnaturally still. It reminds me of blue tinted glass. Not a single wave rolled towards us on land. For some reason, I decide it's a good idea to go out into the water. I take off my sandals and my green dress and wade into the water until it reaches my chest. I look back at you and we've changed positions. Suddenly, you're the one in the ocean with the water up to your chest and I'm back on the sand in my green dress and sandals. And then you slowly disappear underneath the surf. It's at this point I know I'm in a dream, but I always watch you to the end. The top of your Excuse me, the top of your head bounces up and down, ever so slightly breaking the surface of the water as you drift further and further away from the beach. This never worries me. I get the sense you know what you're doing. I yell out your name one final time, and there's a slight twist of your head, and that's it. You're gone, and there's nothing but clear blue water meeting clear blue sky with those threads of pink and gold framing the rising sun, and that's when I wake up. Three. The last time I saw you was outside of a Publix in West Ashley. You were leaving the store as I was entering. You stopped me on the sidewalk, called out Joe, just before I entered, and I only looked up because no one except my mother and sister ever called me Joe. No one except you. I preferred Josephine, then and now, and you knew that. I, did, I didn't recognize you at first. You were just a black man standing on the sidewalk with four brown paper Publix bags in your back, basket. You don't remember me, you asked, with an unconvincing grin so wide I could have counted your teeth if I wanted to. That's when I remembered. We stood there talking for 20 minutes before we each made excuses to go. You handed me your card, Waldo Rollins, attorney, and a flash of sadness went through me. Let's catch up while you're home, you said. Yes, I replied, we should catch up. You went into the parking lot and I walked into the store. I had no intention of calling you or catching up because who actually catches up with their old boyfriend? Except I looked at your card on and off in the days after we ran into each other. I flipped it over again and again and wondered who you were now. I called you a week later. You answered with a hushed whisper. We met at a bar surrounded by people just like us. We had two drinks each before we went to your car. In the cramped back seat, I was reminded of your touch and your kiss of imploring you to go further. Afterwards, you asked me how many more weeks I would be home. I didn't know, so I didn't answer then. We met three more times. Two, my mother called me on an overcast Tuesday morning and told me you were dead. My children were at school, my husband at work, and I was halfway through a bowl of oatmeal. They found him washed up on Hilton Head, my mom said, all the way down there. How in the world did he get there? I took a bite of the oatmeal. Police think it was suicide, she continued, but who knows if that's what it was. All the way down there in Hilton Head, my God. I imagine my mother's shaking head as she spoke. I stay silent. The news says that people saw a man walking into the water out at Folly Beach. You think that was him? I scraped the beige remnants of the oatmeal from the sides of the bowl. He didn't like the water, right, Josephine? No, you didn't like the water. You didn't like the ocean. So many times over spring breaks or summer vacations, I asked you if you wanted to go to the beach, 
begged, pleaded. All our friends are going to be there, I told you. Don't you want to go? But you never wanted to go. I don't fuck with large bodies of water like that, you said, with a face that was still and surprisingly calm. That shit ain't safe. Too much bad shit happens in the water. I didn't understand your aversion. Not until your mother told me that when you were younger, around five, two older white kids threw you into a cloudy black pool and you nearly drowned. I never asked about the beach again. Maybe it was the pool, but every time you refused to go to the beach, it sounded deeper than just a fear of water, as if the water caused you great harm in some other innate, hidden way no one would ever truly understand. As I finished my oatmeal and cleaned my dishes, I wondered when you had made your peace with the water. I wondered if you made your peace right before you walked out into the ocean. I wondered why it had to be the ocean. One. There's a memory that flashes through my mind when I'm driving my kids to school and I'm past the blooming flower garden in front of the building. You and I were at Wanamaker Park and we left the main paved trail halfway through for the shaded, shaded solace of oak trees. We picked out a tree whose branches covered us entirely from the midday sun. We sat under the tree and ate the sandwiches your mother packed for us in our blue cooler. We clowned the people who jogged the trail in the middle of the June afternoon. White people are crazy, we said each time another jogger went by us on the trail. You, you yelled it out once, and we laughed as the jogger stopped and searched the trees, trying to find the stray voice. We had been out there for almost two hours, and I was practically dozing off when you spoke the relative, I mean, you spoke the relative quiet in your voice, matching the quiet of the afternoon. I think I want to be one of those people who fucks with flowers, he said. I was sitting on your right and turned towards you. You plucked a dandelion that had been standing in between our bodies. Plantae, angiosperms, eudicots, asterids, asterales, asteraceae, taraxacum, taraxacum officinale, you announce. With plants, you continued, they have all these different divisions and shit. I must have been looking at you some type of way because you said that you remembered it from AP Biology. I want to be one of those niggas that fucks with nature, he said, almost bashfully, almost ashamed. I didn't know why you looked that way. I held your hand around the dandelion. So be a botanist or whatever, I said. I can't, you responded with a shake of your head. I didn't understand why you couldn't. I still don't understand why you couldn't. But on that June day, you looked down at the dandelion we held. Your thumb twisted it around one way and then the other. A nigga that fucks with nature, you said. Thank you. Thank you. I get the privilege of introducing probably my first friend here at Cornell, Weena Poon. Weena Poon is a writer from Nepal. Her reporting and nonfiction pieces can be found in the Kathmandu Post, Himal South Asian, The Record, Wherever Magazine, in The House of Snow, an anthology of the greatest writing about Nepal. She is currently working on her, working on finishing her first novel. And one of the things I admire about Weena so very much is that she's still working on this novel after a decade. Decade. And the one thing I will finish with is to say that Weena is a very, very good fiction writer. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Weena Poon. Thank you, Shakarian. And thank you to everyone here. Well, I didn't prepare my thank you notes, but you know, I'm very grateful to be here. Okay, uh, let me introduce Carl Moon, a poet. So Carl says he once refused to work with a therapist who beat him at Connect Four. Since then, he's gotten significantly taller. <laughs> All right, Carl Moon. Hello, hello. My therapist was very smug, which is like, you know, when you're a child, like the most embarrassing thing is to be in a room with an adult who's smug about beating you at something. Anyway, um, I guess I would like to start by thanking uh, no one. I did it all myself. Is that right? Is that how we're doing it today? Um, my family's here. Hi. <laughs> uh, uh, so obviously I'm thankful to all of you because you're brilliant, wonderful, amazing writers, and I'm thankful to the department, but I'm most thankful to my grandparents and my mother who are here, and my partner Mimi. Um, 
I think that every step that I take through difficulty uh, is because of the way that I was raised by you, obviously not by Mimi, you didn't raise me, we're, it's a different thing. Um, <laughs> but I'm so happy you're here. Uh, so now I should read a poem that has a bunch of poop and drugs in it, I guess. Uh, now that I've said that, <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, this is the kind of poem that I normally hate. So if you don't like it either, like I'm with you 100%. We're on the same page. All right. Self-portrait is myself. Because I'm worth it. Because it's been hours since I ate the last available sea level cheese for 100 miles, and the snakes in my organs have finally reached a verdict, and the verdict is diarrhea. Because how's that for confessional? Because the more I think, how long before I just give in and unbox my race on YouTube dressed as a doctor who specializes in whispering about press on nail art, the less it seems like a joke. Because once I was asked to worship only those gods tender enough to write, I make you shake with our own tongues. And now I don't know how to stop. Because any good god junkie loose in the Northeast corridor might stumble at any moment upon a parcel of night deer, translucing the barbered lawn of some ceremonial old mansion, these things actually happen, and succumb to the sudden torch of a heart's throat when it breaks from its forage to fix him in the queer equilateral of its gaze. Though looking in the mirror is more and more like pushing my hand into a basin of boiling water, because my own is the mask that suits me best, with the eye holes already cut out, and a rough mouth flap for spitting through. See, my starts bright. Um, this is a slightly better poem, I think. I wrote this one when we were at AWP last year. A bunch of us went to AWP and had a great time, except that everyone looked like me. Every, every man at AWP looked a lot like me. They had the same glasses, like they had the same everything, and it was like very disheartening <laughs> to find out that I was a cliche in that way. Um, so I left AWP and I went to the museum of uh, like the Air and Space Museum because I remembered it being great and it's, it is still great, but it's also very weird. So this is about an exhibit there. Uh, <laughs> it's called Navigation Through the Ages at the National Air and Space Museum. The early mistakes were fishy. We'd go blind fathoming the sun. We thought the moon's traveled pits of darkness were seas. Over and over, we died raveling the wrong invisible line, gored on the peaks of undersea mountains, in the beaks of inky krakens. Now this salty old man is dying to find the thixotropic mission pens that flow upside down on glass. Someone ground a lens, looked out, and saw us at the center. As it happened, the cardinal names devolved to themselves when reeling in solution on a stamped circle of cork. Torbillion, filament, all the precision needed to live through 50 featureless nights, wound in the cold umbilicus of a wire. In the main hangar, kids in bright winter shells bounce past a mercury heat shield, blasted as the lunar surface of a jawbreaker. They are hoping for space ice cream. They are daydreaming dogfights in imagination's swift, straight lines. They are not thinking of what it takes to come back. All right. Um, and this is, I think, the last one that I'll read today. And bear with me, y'all, because I read this, I think, in New York. But then after I read it in New York, Alice was like, that's kind of a good poem. So I was like, well, now I'll read it until I'm dead. <laughs> like, now I don't have a choice, right? So that's kind, of, like, that's kind of, in case you're like, you haven't experienced the mentor-mentee relationship, it's like a little too powerful sometimes, I think. <laughs> Um, so this is about my cell phone. It's called Iteration Cycle. Mm. In a new ad, the chief engineer wears blue jeans on a spaceship more or less made of sourceless light. The point of the jeans is that if you're rich, you're always invited. The point of the light, as with all mysteries, is to give way before the obvious. As we move to voiceover, the phone slips glossily into view like an air hockey puck giving a strip tease. The chief vows they've eliminated all moving parts. This version will withstand a spill down the Marianas Trench, he says. Maybe even a Denny's toilet. For the first time, a machine will search your face for permission, the way your brother often does now that you've grown into perfect strangers. A wire frame dances over a model's features, 
and we are made to understand its writhing constellation as a form of learning. Smile, don't smile. Reject a smell. Recall a disgrace. What is there to feel but gratitude toward this mind built of likelihoods, this haptic student of our moods? I suppose there was the time before all of this when you had me over to watch as you projected landscapes through a giant American flag in your backyard, when between shutter clicks on the carousel called Amber Waves, a loneliness seemed to unfold from your shoulders with the clarity of a passerine about to release its branch and rise. But that was then. Nowadays, whatever isn't news is recollected as an object of nostalgia. Remember all those nude pine power lines and the great sloshing aquariums of local buses? What about the October hands of maples dying in the most lifelike way? I've been doing what stimulation demands, swiping at moments from my life, making dumb smudges of the faces I know, each time breaking the plane of this metaphor for depth, seeming to myself a little more like a filter set to disable the sky or a passenger of the wrapped hand I extend toward this shuddering door, this surface poured to tension, which, TBH, I'd never not enter now. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, it is now my, my great, great, great honor to introduce uh, to you Hema Surendranet. Mm, damn it. Oh, my God. I tried it like six times in my head. <laughs> I found out today that the way I've been pronouncing Hema's last name has been wrong for two years. <laughs> All right. I'm going to introduce Hema Surendranathan. Nathan. Nathan. Oh, Fucking Christ. Okay, excuse me. All right, look, what you need to know about Hema is very clear. Hema is a joint MFA PhD candidate, which makes her smarter than all of the rest of us combined. Her MFA thesis is a collection of short stories concerned with maternity, parenting, and solitude. She's the recipient of the Academy of American Poets Prize at Bryn Mawr College. Bryn Mawr College, excuse me. So she, I guess she bets righty and lefty, which is awesome. And her creative writing can be found in Spillway Magazine. I want to say before Hema comes up that like, she's the kind of person, just really quickly, really quickly, <laughs> who's like supposed to be a thousand years younger than me. But last year, she, I was like, how do you know so much about everything? Like, how are you so centered and awesome about everything? And she was like, you know, I learn a lot through meditation. And honestly, you're the first person who's ever said that to me that I haven't immediately asked to leave my house. <laughs> you are an incredible person. I'm so lucky to know you. everyone. Um, please tell me if I'm not loud enough. I tend to be squeaky. Um, so thank you so much for attending. Um, I'm especially grateful to the creative writing faculty, the English faculty, and the English department staff. And I have to give a big thank you to my family for traveling all the way here. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm feeling quite emotional. Um, from Malaysia just for this weekend. It means a lot to me. Um, also for giving birth to me. <laughs> um, I, I have a special message for my father. I know you really want one of these to be about you, but they're not. <laughs> I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, that time will come, it's not today. <laughs> um, um, finally, I, I owe my biggest thanks to the, all the graduate students, especially in my cohort who edited my writing in and out of workshop. I couldn't have done it with you guys. Um, today I'll be reading six short pieces. Um, I'm not sure if they're prose poems or short stories. There is something in between. Maybe you can tell me what they are. Um, I hope you like them. And I've been working for some of these since August of two years ago, so they're, they, they've been around for a while. One, fig. The New Yorker article says that figs are balls of flowers. The wasps that nest and die in them leave behind skeletons. A small cruelty in the flesh, 
hidden only by the blossom's inversions. Did you see the suggestion of a wing catch the light when we ate dried fruit late at night? I saw you clearly, one rattling bone like an angry filament when you left to shower. Two, 10 minutes. The house on the corner is on fire and I'm washing the dishes and watching it burn. The dish soap smells like menthol and my hair smells like smoke. It is late afternoon and everything is burnt orange. The air thickens into gauze. I put the, tea ke I put the kettle on for tea because it is 10 minutes before my husband comes home. After tea, he changes out of his work clothes and takes a walk around the neighborhood. When I leave the tea bag steeping and go to the living room, I see his work oxfords in a neat pair on the left side of the house. There are sirens outside and sweat settles above my upper lip. I wait by the phone for hours. Three, trash. By the time the civet stopped visiting, my body was already evidence emptied out from the art of its own rage. The civet lurked in the drain outside the house, its tail curled from the decadence of spoiled mango and dried liana. Was it just you made up in animal fur? What did you think would happen? That the front door would be left open or a window? I watched the civet from the kitchen and listened to the kettle singing its terrible song. The trash waits like an animal to be taken out. Four, cabbage. The girl is pretending to be asleep when her mother kisses her forehead and says goodnight. She is awake enough to know that everything is blue in the nighttime, the color of the world before she falls asleep. When she is, she is sure she will not be caught, she walks quietly out of the room, across the carpeted hallway, and down the stairs. Cool, hair, cool air is everywhere. She creeps to the kitchen window and peers into the garden. Her mother's hair is silver. Vegetables swell in the dark. There are pea shoots and grapevines, blithe bushes of parsley, and squash as large as a friendly pig. Her mother presses a glittering cleaver into the root of a cabbage, cabbage that's bloomed. Mother has her back turned, but girl can see mother cut a wedge from the base of the head. Mother peels some outer leaves and lets the blue eat them. Mother, mother takes a tender one from the inside, and she puts it in her own mouth. Girl can taste the cabbage then. It is blue like salt, blue like bitter, blue like earth. Mother turns around. There is blue all around her mouth. Five, your bodies. Your bodies are all in attendance. One's mouth is an O, a rounded lens for calling in light. Another peels a new apple with a clever but blunt knife. The third rubs the sleeves of my new linen shirt that hangs over the dresser. She carries a bag with her, unmarked. In it, I see the bulge of fruit. I imagine dark bruises intended, indented into peaches, contoured like a jaw. None of your bodies bother to speak to me, but they're telling a joke. It passes around quickly the way a ball moves between children in a ring, one unwinding in the center. Your eyes are shutters, the black between digital slides. The room fills with a perfume, the musk of dead fruit, my intemperance circling you like a dog, the jubilation of gardenia. I hear the sound of swallowing, of small hands opening for fruit. I cast my eyes towards an obscured heaven and toss the foolish tone of prayer to an unconcerned divinity. I turn to face all of you. Your bodies are before me at all times, stitching patterns into unnecessary cloth. Six, stone. The man stands outside the cathedral and watches the birds turn the sky gray. He watches them come and go. He watches them eat the bread the children throw onto the ground. 
There is a woman on a bench reading a book that is green like the forest miles away. He imagines sitting next to her on the bench and inviting her to dinner. He would make soup, and when he knows she is looking, he would drop a pebble from the plaza into the pot. After eating, she would ask, where did you find the pebble? Many years later, he will watch builders carve an image into the cathedral. He will reply, yes, this is where it came from, the wondrous stone. Thank you. Um, I have the pleasure of introducing our wonderful mistress of ceremonies, Lindsay Warren. Lindsay is an incredible poet whose work is deeply sensuous. I still remember how I felt after the first time she read um, for all of us at Buffalo Books in our first year. And I'm sure everybody will, will remember what she reads today as well, um, long after this reading. Lindsay asked that I read the following introduction. Um, you'll see that we write quite differently. Um, a failed jazz musician, Lindsay Warren, spent her whole life until recently in Delaware, where she used to work in the library system and as asbestos claims processing. Although she thinks Ithaca is beautiful, Lindsay misses Delaware, since that is where her family and corgi are. Her corgi is more interesting than she is, which I disagree with. <laughs> Thank you for all of your help and your support, friends, family, uh, committees, faculty, co uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you to my beautiful cohort for changing my life for the better. Um, and just a reminder, again, after uh, the reading is over, there will be a reception in the English Lounge upstairs, uh, 258 Goldwyn Smith Hall. And uh, before I read, on a personal note, uh, this was a very tumultuous year for me. So I'm happy and surprised to be here. Uh, and despite all of the chaos, um, Joe Emery, who is sitting right there, was pretty steadfast for me. So I just want to give a special thank you to him. <laughs> Thumbs up. <laughs> OK, without further ado, Abyss after a photograph taken by the artist Crystal Abbas. Assume your body's worry that it will be lost. Put on shoes, walk through evergreen woods. Evergreen has taken over everything, even the trees between the stars. They cry there and their tears freeze over you into glitters you have never seen, since hope now is only felt through what is dark. You climb back into your face as the night leans against the scene's membrane, not to break it, but to breathe on it. Earth lifts its emeralds, so you get a mouthful of loneliness. The sky gives no blink. Your new skin, made of tears, on this side of the light. 628. The street light saves your face for its reflection. The sky squeezes and pours out a forest. In the attic, your coat opens crushed to gold to leaf. I smell like a hungry god. You are beloved in water. All the candles stay lit in the cathedral of rain. This next poem is entitled Terse Sext Known, 1211 Sycamore Avenue. Uh, Terse Sext and Known are canonical uh, prayer hours in Catholicism. And 1211 Sycamore Avenue is the place where I grew up. At the corner was a hole I kept digging, kept giving away, serving the street lamp, my favorite picture book, open to a page of calligraphy clear sky. When I was dusk, I stepped in me. Or did I step in me when I was the thought that the ants on the curb needed to be saved from the latest great flood? the one expected before bedtime, the worry needling its grief into the page of light that was my homework, the light that stood up, engulfed the room, 
the air still a little wet at the bus stop near the yellow leaf on the sidewalk, the yellow morning on the frost, the yellow dust on the moon. And I will finish today um, with a couple shorter poems from a uh, larger work, working title is Saint October, and the poems themselves are untitled, so I'm just gonna zip right through this. Thank you again for coming. Our star dug a road for its day-long shadow through the soil of our hands. When I touch you, I read an injured root. Into posthumous fields I fell meat by meat, moat by moat, O God who dies. My lips penciled in the shade of what is now the over moment. My breath an Ecclesiastes that slats around the heat weight you drag. And my blood, Veronica's yours, is tingles and plums, O oh you God, eat it. My devotion sprawl against a sky low clarity that imposes, that interrupts, that hammers into my penumbra's door its thesis. It is I who have lived too long. Grasses and lights written off, I spill my dyes onto a palette of fadings. Green break, nothing more obscured, no more tessellations of other life. Shade selves I buried resurrect as brightnesses that elevate the vault, the eye of the moment crystal. Where to stand without refuge of shadow, where I stand for myself, in the place of absolution. Sunrise, dismantled and left among the fallen world. This prayer, where a crow pulls its shadow across the membrane of what rose and flaked off into a russet gold scrub, still begotten of breath. In the mirror, the wind. Jets of red and blue, green and gold flood the room. I stand waist deep in loss, and even this must let me go. Thank you very much. has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.